So I think we are in a time right now of continued and in some ways um, reignited uncertainty, but the world goes on. And I think what we've seen through some companies is their ability to really innovate through adversity. And today, that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about how companies can innovate through this, because um, despite how bad th things look from time to time, we are still in a time right now of real opportunity. Um, you know, with change comes opportunity, comes um, new markets, comes new insights that allows businesses to really pivot and drive their business. And through the research we've conducted, we're going to identify some of those opportunities today. Um, I'm Matt Britton, I'm the founder and CEO of Suzy. Uh, we are a market research uh, technology that works with over 250 leading companies to help them really put their finger on the pulse of the consumer. Um, our always on DIY software tool allows brands to speak to consumers in real time to really drive decisions with consumer centricity. And I think now more than ever, uh, you can basically throw out all the conventional notions that you might have of your consumer out the window, we really need to reimagine who our consumer is, and there really is no way to do so unless we're listening. Um, and really, Susie enables businesses to listen. Um, today, we are conducting uh, a webinar based upon that listening. Um, we conducted a study very recently, uh, and that's another thing Susie allows you to do is conduct research where you can get the results back during the same meeting you're in. But we and we conducted the research today uh, from. June 30th through July 1st, we talked to a thousand Americans and the data that we're going to be disclosing today is directionally representative of U.S. consumers who work from home um, and it's census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity and region. Um, so uh, without further ado, we are going to dive in and talk about innovating through adversity. Uh, I love this quote from Henry Ford that said, when everything seems to be going against you, remember that the airplane takes off against the wind not with it. And I think that's, you know, that quote uh, really stuck with me uh, because it's really just about, you know, any great innovation that's happened throughout history and in our time has really happened with headwinds. And, you know, many believe that some of the greatest startups um, in history are being invented at this very moment, uh, because usually when you have headwinds, there is opportunity, uh, you know, because the, you know, the airplane takes off with uh, wind against it, um, you know, it creates an opportunity um, for the, it to really get the thrust and power it needs for when it gets in the air to be at the right cruising altitude to have the right speed. And I do believe that businesses really face a very similar dilemma right now and a similar opportunity. Um, COVID may provide uh, pressure companies need to normalize technology has been there for years. And you know, we talk so much about COVID being an accelerant. And I think not a lot has been discussed in terms of why it's an accelerant. Um, and the reason why is in the absence of other options, of traditional options to get things done, whether it's seeing the doctor, whether it's communicating with other people, conducting business as normal, paying people, all of a sudden now it actually brings up new opportunities that people are adopting that they never would have adopted for five, 10, some instances, 20 years later. Um, something happened to me personally yesterday where I was actually in the car and my phone, my iPhone completely died. And I had a business call that was very important that I was going to be late for um, because I was in traffic. And the only thing I had on me was my Apple watch. And I looked at the functionality of Apple watch and through voice, I actually started texting people by talking to my watch. And you know what? It worked really well. And as a result of that, I'm going to be using that Apple Watch for texting a lot more, even when I get my phone back. I never would have used that functionality on the Apple Watch unless my phone died. And now, next time I'm driving, texting, although really nobody should text and drive, but the notion of me even texting and driving won't even be an option because I know my watch has functionality that I can rely upon in a new way. And I think that's really the opportunity in a nutshell right now is that in the absence of things that people normally did, they are searching and finding other ways, which is really driving that acceleration. And as a result, when we return to normal, it really won't be normal. Um, we're not really ever going back to um, a pre-pandemic um, state again. Um, some things will seem more like normal. Other things, again, will be completely different. I know you guys have heard that over and over and over again. And I, so I personally hate the term uh, new normal. Um, but continues, consumers have changed and will continue to change. 84% of people plan to keep the routines they adopted during the COVID-19 crisis after it's over. Now, 
there's a difference between what consumers assume they're going to do and actually the way in which they tend to act. And I do think that some things they may think they may never do again, they will, such as going to restaurants or traveling or things of that nature. But there certainly are a lot of those routines that will stick uh, with consumers. Um, ultimately, though, it's about listening and changing right now. Um, we've had tremendous demand um, for our Suzy tool over the last three to four months because I think the smart companies are realizing that, again, if they don't listen, they're going to be completely um, into the dark. And this you know, platform really provides the opportunity to really listen and understand what consumers are saying. Uh, I thought this was a good example in terms of a business that's really being forced to reimagine themselves. Um, Sephora, a retailer, um, Ulta, another one, these beauty brands, um, over time have really had the ability in their retail environment to allow consumers to try on before they buy, test beauty products, see how it looks on them before they actually uh, bought the products. And now with retail not being open the way it was prior, these businesses now have to find new ways to allow consumers to try before they buy. Maybe it's through in-home sampling. Maybe it's through curbside uh, try-ons if their stores aren't open. And maybe those uh, new pivots on try before you buy will become their new way of operating. Because again, they're forced and have no other choice but to not actually allow consumers to go into the store and trial their products. So uh, we are going to be talking about today uh, four what we call consumer kicks busting down the door, uh, which create uh, you know opportunities for brand innovation. The territories that we believe uh, brands can play in to really identify uh, new blue ocean markets to really be able to drive their business in the midst of this continued uncertainty. The first of which is consumer essentials. Uh, the notion of what's essential and what's core it has really forever been changed. And that has created new opportunities and new growth for brands in many different categories. Second is consumer confusion. Uh, consumers are incredibly confused right now about their lives, about their future, about their budgets, um, about what to buy and how to buy. And that creates opportunities for brands to create clarity. Third is consumer health and the resurgence of interest in consumer health around all categories and re really redefining what it means to be a health brand. And lastly, the notion of consumer community, how consumers now more than ever are seeking community to connect with one another in a world where they are not able to have that personal um, interaction. So the first area we're going to be talking about today um, is consumer essentials. And we're going to, uh, as we always, go to our Ask America section to allow you guys to actually tell us um, uh, what question you actually want us to have answered in the Suzy platform. Um, so here's around the notion of consumer essentials. Uh, vote right now which question was to ask. One, which brands have been the most essential for you in the past three months? Two, what is an item that you've decided is not essential due to the current crisis? Three, what is an item you decided is now essential due to the restrictions? And four, which items do you think will stay essential? So select the question that you, you'd like to see most answered. And uh, my trusty colleague, Abel, will have it answered. And uh, at the end of this presentation, we'll go through it for you. So uh, I'll give you guys 10 seconds, and we will then move on. OK. So 65% of people agree that their definition of the word, uh, word essential has changed. What it means to be essential, and thanks, Christina, saying this is fun. We're glad you're having fun answering the questions, trying to make this uh, a little bit more interactive. 65% um, of the people agree that their definition of the word essential has changed since 2019. Uh, and, you know, Abel, uh, my trusty colleague, is going to actually show you guys a video. We talked to consumers and asked them to actually elaborate what it means uh, to be essential. So, Abel, if you want to roll that video quickly. Has become a little bit more important to us. Everything related to home expenses, even like updating our like home, updating our decorating, home, decorating it. it. Uh, we have bought a few we have bought a few for our home as well. Home as well. Has become a has little, become bit, more a little bit more to us. important to us. So here you see a mother from Florida saying that home decor and home decoration has become more essential. Um, as consumers spend more and more time at home, um, things like uh, you know furnishing their homes, having the right in-home technology is something that's incredibly important uh, you know, for brands um, in their world. Uh, thanks, Cameron, to say there's an echo. Um, I'll have to turn my sound off um, for when we play the videos. So thanks for, thanks for that. Um, 
So non-essential brands are now pivoting to become essential. Uh, brands in the past that maybe haven't been known as things that have to be mainstay for the consumer uh, now certainly are. Uh, one of which is masks. Uh, you know, masks have become a new type of fashion item, uh, you know, for consumers it has become really uh, a way. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I, I understand that. Uh, so a question just came in. There's an echo when we played the audio. Uh, that was my fault because I actually wanted to hear it. And because of it, I played it on my computer. You guys heard it again. But the question is, can Suzy capture audio? Is that part of the tool now? And the answer is yes. Suzy recently rolled out a new tool called Suzy Live that actually allows brands to conduct one-on-one -on -one in-person live interviews on demand with consumers. So if you guys are interested in that, you guys can follow up. Um, so back to masks, masks are something that has really become a mainstay, uh, fashion, uh, you know, accessory for consumers. It's something that they're wearing every day in some ways more than they were wearing hats and, and, and other type of accessory based garments, um, in the past. So this creates, you know, a real opportunity, uh, for brands. Now you can see Adidas kind of coming in with traditional branding, but now you see a brand like Louis Vuitton saying, you know what, for our luxury consumer, our fashion consumer, you know, maybe this is a, and yes, Andrea, Susie also can capture video as well. Um, you know, for our, for, for, for our luxury fashion based consumer, this is something that has become now important to them. And for Louis Vuitton to create in their, you know, classic style um, mask that they're selling, um, obviously at a premium price, just shows now that this is new a new essential garment. Will mass become mainstay moving forward? In my personal opinion, I don't think, i hoping we're gonna be in the world, especially post-vaccine, where consumers will not be uh, wearing masks every day. But if you've traveled to Asia, you'll know that some consumers uh, in Asia wear masks quite often when they're going on public transportation or when they're around crowds. And I actually think masks will become a, you know, a, an accessory that lasts with the consumer far beyond this. Is, is it going to be something that they wear every day? Again, hopefully not. Um, 33% of people say that meaning of the word essential is broadened for them. And one of the areas that it's really broadened for them is they now believe alcohol is essential. Um, consumers have been stuck at home. We've often talked in our past webinars about the shifting nature of the consumption of food and beverage. And Drizzly is a company that delivers um, alcohol at home. It's one of the few areas now um, that that Amazon doesn't compete in and has created, you know, a really big opportunity right now. And, you know, Drizzly has taken advantage of it. They are up 1600% year over year in delivery of alcohol. And as consumers are stuck at home, trying to figure out how to entertain their families, um, knowing they can't go to bars and restaurants, um, many consumers, you know, have resorted to drinking at home. Um, hopefully it's, within healthy moderation, but for many consumers, they would now define alcohol as essential, um, especially for in-home consumption. And that's being really reflected, uh, you know, with the growth of a company like Drizzly. 71% um, of respondents say technology is essential to their happiness. Now, many would say the technology has always been essential to their happiness, especially younger generations. But this has really put technology front and center. Because, and here, I got a question I'm going to actually address. With, isn't alcohol as a category de declining for millennials? So, you know, alcohol consumption has been, um, especially on premise, has been um, in decline for millennials. And a lot of that has been related to the legalization of marijuana um, in many states. And many consumers have uh, moved slightly away from alcohol. However, in this pandemic, off premise, it has seen a resurgence even with millennials. It's kind of taken on a whole new life in terms of um, being a craft, in terms of people learning mixology, how to make their own drinks at home, doing virtual happy hours. And as a result, it is getting a resurgence with millennials, but it's getting a massive boost with Gen X and, and baby boomers uh, during this pandemic. Uh, but going back to um, technology, you know, for many consumers, it has long been um, something that's essential for younger consumers, but now it's become in a lot of ways a lifeline for consumers of all ages, you know, really giving them the ability um, to communicate with the people who they love uh, because they can't do it on a face-to-face -face level. Technology doesn't just mean communication, it means entertainment. Um, Animal Crossing, which is a game um, by Nintendo, has been an absolute smash hit 
uh, throughout this pandemic. Uh, it has sold 13 and a half million copies since its release in late March. Um, other, uh, you know, very popular games like Fortnite um, and Roblox have even seen uh, more growth than they were seeing prior to this. The thing about these games is they connect entertainment and connectivity. You're not just playing by yourself. Uh, that you know they are basically creating a communal aspect where you can meet other people, connect with your friends, team up with other people in the context of a video game, and that's a big reason why Animal Crossing um, has had such a great level of success um, through this, as well as some of their other peers. Um, older generations have long avoided certain types of technology that they now feel is incredibly essential. Um, you know, types of technology, mostly that really allows them to connect. Uh, Zoom was a brand uh, within the baby boomer generation. And uh, even a lot of uh, Gen Xers who weren't in necessarily in the technology industry didn't know what Zoom was headed into this pandemic. Zoom is now a verb in America. Zoom is now a word where when people, um, you know, you know, say that let's connect, or they say let's Zoom, let's Zoom for our family. And the tool has been easy enough for uh, less tech, technological illiterate consumers to really be able to understand and adopt. So basically it's created a big opportunity for consumers to connect with each other and has created a forcing function for older consumers to adopt this type of technology. If you think about it, um, tools like Skype and then FaceTime have been around for such a long time. And before the pandemic, it wasn't necessarily commonplace to pick up the, the phone and just FaceTime somebody. Uh, you might do it with close family members, but you certainly wouldn't do it if you were doing a business call. And now all of a sudden it's become commonplace. Now it's almost the de facto standard for consumers to use uh, video-based technology um, you know, to communicate with each other on a face-to-face -face basis. And I think that that's gonna be something again, that I think is gonna last um, you know, long past this pandemic in terms of people adopting uh, you know, video-based uh, communications. Um, does your brand belong in a new broad and essential category? So we talk about video games, we talk about technology and mass. Is there an opportunity for somehow for you to position your brand to be able to be deemed um, as essential it is a question. We're gonna go into our next um, you know, section, which is consumer confusion. But first we are gonna ask America. Um, Abel is going to pull open um, a poll uh, of four questions uh, you, that you'd like us to ask. Uh, about consumer confusion. First and foremost, what information you find most important to know during this time? Secondly, what information you wanna hear more from brands? What information you wanna hear less from brands? And which brands have done the best at giving you the information you need it during this time? So I will give you a second to select uh, the question that you'd like most answered. Um, and then we are going to move on to our next um, consumer confusion section of this presentation. So people are, first of all, a lot of confusion is being driven by our government. This I never get into politics in business, especially in this day and age. Uh, it is a very, very tough place to play. Um, we're going to be talking during this presentation about brands taking the stand. It's something that I've long struggled with in terms of the separation of church and state. You know, when is it okay for me to talk on behalf of my company, Susie? When should I be talking on behalf of myself? When am I speaking on behalf of our employees? I think we all can kind of um, empathize with how hard it is to know what to say and when to say it in this new cancel culture. But one thing that's really undeniable right now is that people are really feeling frustrated, confused, and angry just about you know, conflicting opinions and feedback about government guidance. Uh, this is a time where our country needs to be unified um, in terms of, um, you know, how we feel about this incredibly uh, scary time and what we're hearing from governments because it's such a polarized world, um, you know, in the political landscape is so divergent that it's just creating more, you um, confusion for consumers. And that has really created an opportunity for brands to step in. Uh, so we're going to move to our next Suzy Live uh, video, which is I'll where you've been getting media. your information from during the quarantine. So you can roll with it. Abel. Be on social media like Facebook. And I um, read a lot of news articles on there as well. But you never know. It's so many different stories. So you don't know what to believe. It's like everybody got a different story about what's going on. 
So you can see, you know, a mother from Iowa is basically saying um, that, you know, there's so much confusion right now that people really don't know what to believe. And I think, you know, a lot of, you know, politicians as well as platforms have really played their role in it in terms of the truth being buried and again, really confusing consumers, which has created an opportunity for brands. Uh, one thing we've seen recently, um, you know, and we're actually still seeing right now is this big ad boycott happening on Facebook where many big brands um, are, are, beyond, uh, are behind this stop hate for profit campaign. Uh, basically under the notion that many believe that Facebook has not done enough to uh, rid its platform of, of hate speech. Um, and basically that people feel that they have a responsibility and there's long been pressure from the media um, and more recently government to, you know, regulate Facebook and other social media platforms. But not until very recently, this is Facebook actually making changes and what they're actually doing doing to drive change is starting to listen to their biggest advertisers. Uh, several hundred brands and businesses um, have proclaimed that they, for the month of July, will stop advertising on Facebook as the way as a way to actually pressure the platform to actually make changes. Something uh, very similar happened this week with in the NFL with the Washington Redskins. Many have long thought the Redskins uh, team name uh, was something that was quite racist and offensive uh, to American Indians. And now, based upon pressure that's actually happening um, from brands, uh, the Washington Redskins have made the decision that they're going to rename their team. So it's one thing that's really interesting here is how powerful brands really are that nor the government, nor consumers, um, you know, nor the media has had the ability to make some of these platforms and businesses change. But once actually the advertisers that are supporting these platforms start to actually speak up, change seems to happen instantly. So brands are realizing the power that they have and brands are realizing that now maybe they actually do need to step up and they actually do need to um, start to actually, um, you know, stand up for what's important. Um, the Redskins have not actually decided what they're renaming their team name to, but I would imagine they would have to decide uh, pretty soon. So brands are obviously really going to be judged right now, too. I think right now there is just so much risk right now um, for brands in, for anything they put out. I think consumers are looking to um, find reasons, not all, but some, uh, to basically attack um, brands and consumers for uh, and people and influencers and celebrities for what they've said now or done in the past, et cetera. And I think it's more important than ever for businesses to really listen um, and for businesses to really, um, you know, talk to consumers before they put something out there. So it's okay for them to take a stand, but you better make sure that your consumers are okay with it. Um, other brands have really taken matters into their own hands and looked at this crisis as an opportunity to provide real leadership. Um, the Gap for, is a great example. Their teams are connecting some of the largest hospital networks in California uh, with their vendors to deliver PPE supplies. Um, Gap, obviously, despite their recent troubles, has a very powerful supply chain. And they've used that supply chain for good um, in allowing, um, you know, hospitals and other medical workers to connect with members of their supply chains um, to get the, the necessary equipment that, that their doctors and healthcare providers need. And I think it's a great example of brands taking a stand, again, in some ways that the government hasn't. Other brands have taken um, a stand by helping consumers stay healthy. Uh, Rumble, which was an incredibly fast growing startup um, in the fitness space, start to introduce daily live Instagram workouts with their most popular, um, you know, uh, boxing teachers. And MyFitnessPal, which is a platform that's owned by Under Armour, start to launch, again, free seven minute at home workouts. So this is an example of brands taking leadership in the space where they feel they have a right to play, um, which is the health space, which obviously right now is more important than ever before. Uh, which we'll get into. As a result, uh, you know, 38% of people say they trust brands more than they actually trust the government. And I think that's, you know, a startling stat. So if you're a CMO of a major brand, just know that they are in a big position right now, whether they like it or not. If you are the CEO or CMO of a large consumer packaged goods company or automotive or financial services company, just know that 
your brand and the emblem and trust of your brand now is taken on a completely new meeting, whether you like it or not. And there's many different ways for you to approach it. Some brands, you know, have the ability. Jeff Bezos can say what he wants, right? Because A, he's not missing a meal anytime soon, but B, their brand could withstand a variety of boycotts and pressure and still be fine. Small companies, maybe not so much, where if small companies lost a couple advertisers, they might be out of business. And for taking a stand, maybe now they have to let off some of their employees because they're losing business. So I don't think it's imperative for every business to step up. And you know that's frankly what I struggle with is there's a lot more that sometimes I'd like to say, but if that means that we're going to lose some customers and we're a smaller startup and that means it impacts our business, well, what does that mean? And I think that's a struggle that a lot of people, um, you know, that are running smaller businesses and even larger businesses deal with. Um, but I think it's inherent in all of us to give back and do something where we can help drive movement. And that's something that we have certainly done in areas like uh, social justice as of late with our CrowdTap platform. Um, consumer health is the third category, which uh, obviously has taken on a completely new meaning uh, in terms of as a central platform. Um, and we're going to go back to Ask America now. Um, and we would like you to answer one of these four questions um, on the Suzy platform regarding health. Uh, one, should brands play a role in talking about mental health? Two, should brands play a role in talking about physical health? Three, which brands have been critical to your health, physical, and mental during quarantine? And four, what health-related information do you want to see more of from brands? So we'll give you a second to answer that, and we will go on to our section about health. Okay. So uh, we're going to play a quick video in terms of how quarantine has affected the ways that you think about your health. So let's roll to the tape. Abel. Staying physical has been a challenge. Uh, my New Year's resolution was going to the gym, and I was doing that five times a week, pretty much right up until the point where they closed the gym. And I should have probably kept up with it at home, but I haven't. So this really shows the struggles that many consumers are feeling um, when it comes to personal, physical, mental health, where, um, you know, a lot of people had resolutions of going to the gym. Um, some people have really been adapt to um, a new way of staying fit um, at home through some of these online streaming fitness platforms. But for other consumers, they've been taken uh, out of the routine. They've been taken out of the gym. Um, and it's been harder for them to stay actually fit, uh, both medically, mentally and physically um, through this crisis. And indeed, many consumers say they are struggling to stay healthy. 48% uh, of consumers are saying that they uh, are struggling to stay mentally healthy. And 44% are struggling to stay physically healthy during this. And you know that's certainly something that creates an opportunity. These health concerns aren't going to go away after the crisis. And, you know, many believe, myself included, that a new health economy uh, may rise. The global wellness economy um, is already at uh, $4.5 trillion, and it is definitely growing uh, with consumers, you know, who believe that now health should be at the center in terms of what they think um, and feel. Some brands have taken advantage of it. Uh, Peloton being a tremendous, uh, you know, star through this because they have provided consumers what they desperately need, a way to stay fit, a way to stay active uh, while at home. Their, their platform isn't, doesn't just allow you to stay fit, but it allows you to feel connected to other people. It allows you to be pushed by a trainer. And because of that, many believe that the growth of Peloton will continue Will this come at the you know the expense of traditional gyms? Uh, but Peloton has been another company that is quickly becoming a verb in America um, in terms of you know being synonymous with um, in-home workouts, in-home cycling, etc. Um, Lululemon is another company that has really proven um, you know how this fitness craze can really drive business. Um, they have had tremendous growth in terms of their in-home um, you know work. The, their gear that's being worn in home. Lululemon as a company uh, first really took off 
through them being a fashionable uh, yoga wear brand. And it was for affluent, what we call yoga moms in the consumer insights community um, that really wanted to look good while going to the gym. But now they've really done a great job at really positioning their brand as one that really um, has the technical, um, you know, ability and and you know, sort of the comfort to be able to really pivot to being a brand that you can wear at home. They also also this past week bought a company called Mirror, which is kind of like a Peloton for in home exercising. So they actually can get technology in the home. And I think those two things combined really will make, uh, you know, Lululemon a force to be reckoned with uh, moving forward as a business. Supplements has seen a tremendous boom, you know, often seen by consumers as a non-essential healthcare um, accoutrement. Now, many consumers feel that they need. And there's been a massive boom in the buying of supplements uh, for consumers. And in some ways now, every business is now a health business. Clearly, if you are a hotel or an airline, you now need to be adept in how are you sanitizing your venues? How are you giving consumers um, the peace of mind? If you are a retailer or a restaurant, yesterday I ordered takeout from a restaurant in Manhattan. And when I signed for the credit card bill, there were two cups, one for the sanitized pens and one for the non-sanitized pens. So here a restaurant actually needs to think about sanitization of pens. So so every business now has to be a health business. Just like for a while, we were saying every business has to be a tech business. That's really expanded to the healthcare category. 70% um, of, of, of people are concerned about health considerations when purchasing a vehicle now. Um, you know, they are, many new vehicle manufacturers are doing things like allowing you to read your pulse or temperature actually in a car. So I think the automotive categories are now um, necessary. Um, I see a comment from Stephanie about how employers are going to step up their health care plans and maternity leaves. And can we catch up to Europe? I mean, I think that's a, a great point in terms of, um, you know, employers now need to be adept at health, at wellness, at really keeping consumers um, up to speed uh, there as well. 93% uh, of people who use branded resources to stay healthy say they're going to continue using them in the future. So this goes back to the Pelotons of the world. This goes back to the companies that really have taken advantage of um, in-home workouts. Telehealth has seen a tremendous boom right now. Uh, what is telehealth? Telehealth is the ability to conduct um, interactions with doctors and other healthcare providers um, remotely. Uh, and it allows these doctors to prescribe medications from you just by looking at, uh, looking at you and talking to you. Uh, there is now a host of new technologies that will allow you to take your temperature, your blood pressure, and a variety of other vitals remotely. So you can actually um, do many of what you used to be able to do by going into the doctor at home. And this obviously just could create a massive impact in the healthcare industry. Doctors who are in India or Israel, or other areas of the world can now all of a sudden service consumers in America. Um, you know, what does this mean for people who go to med school now and you'll now compute, you're competing with other doctors on a globalized basis, maybe with other countries that can actually, um, you know, give you healthcare much more efficiently. So is healthcare going to be globalized? Now, obviously surgeries, you're, right now, you're not gonna be able to get through telehealth. Uh, certain people will always wanna talk to doctors in person for some things, but it's undeniable the shift that telehealth is bringing to this industry. Um, there is now immunity boosting gum um, in the confections category. So no matter what category that you're in right now, uh, many brands see this as an opportunity, um, you know, to enter the healthcare space um, and put in the right types of ingredients to make consumers feel like they're helping their health. So is there a health economy white space for your business is a question I'd be asking right now, no matter what category you're in, because health has now become um, front and center for consumers. Uh, we're going to go into our next section, consumer community, and we're going to go back to Ask America um, with one of these four questions. I'll let you guys read them and pick the one that you want Susie to answer for you. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for answering. It's great to see everyone so engaged um, in the webinar. Um, so consumer community, 35% of consumers are buying from brands that fit their needs without taking into account the causes that brands support. So some consumers 
don't care. But many obviously um, are speaking at, about brands that are supporting things that they believe in. It's really driving their purchase habit. So um, Abel, let's roll to the tape for this example. I think all the, like the 3M is, is one that is doing a lot for their, for the health workers and the frontline uh, essential workers. I think Walmart is doing a good job with the, uh, because I have some friends that work for Walmart and they're doing some protective measures and they're paying bonuses to their employees. And so th they're doing a good job protecting their, their employees, putting on masks, daily temperature checks, providing sanitizers to them and then masks to them and then um, those protective plexiglasses and all that. So yeah, they, they, those two are doing a good job, I think. So what this man is speaking of is basically that Walmart is taking pride in their ability to keep their employees safe. And 3M is doing a lot for the healthcare workers. And because these companies are doing things to give back to their employees, it matters. And it's something that's being noticed by this consumer. And as a result, he's more likely to patronize these organizations. And I think this is an important point. I think now more than ever, while some consumers don't care and they're still going to be looking for the cheapest possible product, many do. And if your brand is doing things to give back to your employees, your communities, et cetera, it creates an opportunity for you to actually um, share it. Um, you know, when learning about brands, consumers care about sourcing. They compare, they, they do care about the support of causes, but at the same time, they also care about brands that actually give them the value that they, uh, that they care about most. So it's really important right now that brands know their community. They know how consumers are thinking and feeling about them. So they know what types of initiatives that they should be highlighting, um, on their behalf. Two thirds of people agree that brands have responsibility to support the local communities in which they do business. Uh, many local businesses right now are struggling in a big way. And if your business is in a market where people are struggling, you know, there is a responsibility for you to give back. And that's, that's when you do give back, it's something you should tell people about. You should tell people how you're giving back to inspire others to do the same because it's obviously something that's super important. Obviously, Nike is has been a brand that is best known for this. And it seems that every time a big crisis comes out, Nike, whether, whether it's about social injustice, um, whether it's about um, supporting um, impoverished communities, um, you know, inner city youth, et cetera, Nike always seems to be one of the first companies in the best possible way to jump on this. Um, most recently, they teamed up with Michael Jordan to do a $100 million donation uh, to support social justice initiatives. So I think they're, they've kind of established themselves really as truly uh, the gold star. So the big question is really, what does your community need? And knowing what that needs really will enable you um, to deliver upon that. And again, set an example for others. So um, we're going to go to Q&A. We have a ton of questions coming in. It's been hard to um, give this webinar while seeing so many great questions come at the same time. Um, but in summary, consumers have really opened up the doors for brands to redefine and shape themselves to fill consumers' essential needs foster connection by engaging and educating consumers in everyday life issues, enter in the health and wellness space regardless of category, and to begin to really foster your community, both um, in a physical and virtual format to give back and to create deeper connections with consumers. So these are opportunities to really innovate through adversity for brands to really be able to make lemonade out of lemons, so to speak. Um, and I'm curious to know what everyone thinks. So I don't know, Abel, if you want to jump on now um, so we can actually go into some Q&A, that'd be great. I don't know if you, I can grab you on video, but it'd be great for everyone to see you again. So let's uh, try to drop you in too. Okay. First, I believe, um, Abel, we're going to go through the answers for the questions that we asked. Is that correct? Yes. So uh, in the last 45 minutes, we've asked those four questions that um, you all wanted to know about. So the first one here is, uh, which brands have been critical to your health, both physical and mental during quarantine? Um, so some of the top options we got here were Lysol, Apple, uh, YouTube, Walmart, Amazon, Netflix, uh, Centrum, Clorox, and Nike. Um, so people right. kind of in- yeah, Really the, no surprises there, right? No, no, very- um, yeah, I mean, I think you, you look at YouTube, Amazon, Netflix, people, it's essential to keep themselves, you know, um, you know, 
entertained. I, you look at a brand like Walmart and Amazon, these businesses in terms of their impact on the supply chain and what would happen if anything happened with those companies. I mean, they really kept America in many ways satiated uh, during this uh, quarantine. Then you see cleaning supplies like Clorox and Lysol, as well as Centrum, again, reflecting back to what we've identified in terms of this huge health and wellness craze coming out of this. Yeah, and I think something interesting during the kind of Suzy Live interview, something that repeatedly people said was now the importance of entertainment as part of your mental health. So Netflix is now more than ever um, kind of helping them keep busy and giving them something to look forward to. Um, and that's now kind of risen to the top as something essential. Um, here, the second one is which brands have done the best at giving you the information you need? Um, Twitter. Target, Google, Nike, Instagram, Starbucks, Walmart, CNN, Lysol, Amazon, Apple, Clorox, and YouTube. Um, here are what items do you think will stay essential after COVID-19? Um, so a lot of the same kind of health sanitizers, masks, disinfectants, uh, antibacterials, gloves, soaps, hygiene, uh, Clorox. So again, a lot of things that a lot of people have started using at the beginning of it. Um, will now kind of stick through. Yeah. Uh, and then a final question of how do you want brands to help your community? Um, they're looking for donations. Uh, they're looking for them to program activities, deliver charity, kind of distribute goods, money, um, help them with pricing. So um, they're looking for kind of both monetary and, and supplies that can help support those communities. That's great. Well, thank you for pointing those together so quickly for us able should we um go to the, the q a like yeah absolutely i think all the Great. like the um okay so first question for you matt is for the louis vuitton example uh, masks do you feel that this feels gimmicky uh do you feel like they have a right to play in this space as a luxury a good great, brand i think it's a great i think it's a great question um i think that as masks become more of a mainstay uh, you know consumer accessory and it becomes things that consumers need to buy every day. And it becomes a new form of expression. I think it's totally fine for these businesses to be able to start to market products in that category. Um, you know, but I see the point of the question. Like, I'm a huge fan of the Philadelphia Eagles, as you know. And um, I saw that they were selling Philadelphia Eagles branded mess. And, you know, do if I wore one and somebody I respected saw me wearing that, how would they feel? about me. Um, and I think that's really, um, you know, something that I think about, but I think over time as masks become more commonplace, I do think it's okay that for businesses to play in that space because listen, it's something consumers need ultimately. Right. And I don't look at it as opportunistic, but I do think it's a great question. I guess on the flip side there, um, do you think it's better that those kind of brands are giving direct donations to maybe healthcare companies that can build that versus using it as a branding opportunity? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think any business that can right now give back should. And I think if you're selling a product that is essentially capitalizing on the pandemic, I do think it's incumbent on you to try to give back if you can, for sure. Um, so I think things like what Gap is doing is incredible in terms of collecting their, connecting their supply chain with medical workers. So I think that, that you know, I, I think it's a good idea. But I, again, like I, I don't necessarily think a business is wrong for selling mess. Um, because you see it, consumers are using it as a way to express themselves and it's our new reality, right? You might as well accept it and go with it. Definitely. Um, a lot of people have kind of questions about Suzy Live and Suzy itself. Um, one of the questions that they have here is, uh, do you guys focus only on insights service side? Have you guys ever considered uh, partnering different companies based on the insights that you're finding, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, this person yeah, um, works within the head of innovation at a healthcare company, um, and she's very curious about that. Yeah, so, I mean, we work with clients in a variety of different formats. We're a software company that has a powerful tool, but we also have a lot of um, strategists and great customer success and insights people in our organization. So we're open to it. And I would just say, without knowing the specifics, it's hard to answer that. So let's just definitely connect. Um, you know, you can reach out to me, uh, my email address, which we'll throw on the screen at the end of the Q&A. Definitely. Definitely. Um have you guys seen any research about the rise of the democratization of resources, whether that's gig economy, rise of entrepreneurship, money, anything like that? So I don't have, I mean, I can speak to it. I don't have data off the top of my head that I can, you know, throw out about that. 
But I think that many, you look at Etsy, for example, Etsy stock price has exploded. What is Etsy? Etsy is a tool that allows people to make their own crafts and sell it online. eBay is another platform that allows people to sell their used items. Consumers have had a lot of free time right now. Many consumers are searching for additional streams of income in the wake of this economic uncertainty. And as a result, it's created an opportunity for consumers to be resourceful in terms of tapping into their entrepreneurial spirit. Um, you know, many have said that WeWork was going to die um, coming into this. I saw an announcement yesterday that WeWork now expects to be cash flow pos positive in 2021. You know, our office, we've talked about a lot. Our office lease actually ends this month. We are going completely remote at Suzy uh, with our nearly 100 employees for the rest of this year. But there is a world in September, October, where maybe we start to tap into WeWork where we can have smaller meetings. And maybe instead of signing a long-term lease, we'll tap into WeWork in areas where maybe consumers don't want to commute on public transportation. So I think a tool like WeWork for consumers might come back in vogue, um, you know, all of a sudden coming out of this. It's interesting. So, you know, speaking of kind of the workplace, um, your role as CEO, it, as someone that employs a large amount of people, how has your definition of the word essential really changed, um, especially when it comes to kind of running a company? Yeah, I think that it's a great question. I think that communication has become much more essential. Um, as you know, you know, Abel, we try to do uh, all staff meetings every single week for our employees to really keep them in the loop because what you lose in a remote environment is you lose that serendipity. Uh, you know, Unless you've scheduled time to talk to someone, you're not going to talk to someone. And the, I believe a lot of the magic in companies come from that serendipity. So I think fostering communication, because communication isn't just going to happen organically, has become essential. I think listening to employees has become essential in a world where many employees and people are struggling with mental health issues or struggling with working from home because they have child care issues, et cetera. So I think listening has always been essential, but now it's more essential than ever before. And I also think listening to your customers is more essential. No matter what business you're in, it's changed. And what's important to your customers last year is not necessarily what's important to them now. So I think really being collaborative with your customers, listening to their needs, having it impact your your uh, pipeline and roadmap, I think is incredibly important as well. Definitely. Uh, Matt, a lot of people have questions about kind of the Suzy consumer audience base. Could you tell us a little bit about um, what's that's comprised about and where it's located? Yeah. So we have um, a million US consumers who have signed up for a platform called CrowdTap. Uh, which you can download from the App Store, um, either on iOS or Android, uh, which allows consumers to essentially um, earn rewards uh, by answering questions from brands that are completely anonymous uh, in, from the brand side. And it's really a fun and easy way for the consumer to give feedback. Uh, the feedback that they submit gets them points, which they can cash in for digital rewards. Um, but we think it's really in line with how consumers want to respond to brands right now, which is quick form. They don't, what, what we know about the millennial consumer who's now, let's face it, the buyer of the U.S. household, they don't like surveys. They don't like filling out 25 question surveys about one topic. They'd rather just give quick tidbits, more iterative feedback to brands so they can learn over time. So we think that we've created a tool on their consumer side, which helps the consumers give feedback, but also helps brands get what they need, which is instant uh, you know, consumer um, information to help drive their decision making. Um, our platform is census ways, weighted across most um, you know, census-based criteria. So brands and brands can also target, obviously, who they want to talk to. Um, and we work with brands across you know, almost every major sector. It really helping them listen to consumers to help drive their decisions. Definitely. Um, next question for you, Matt, is uh, have you seen um, brands who have done a really good job with kind of taking um, these insights and applying them um, to kind of preventing or encouraging them in a new direction? Yeah, I mean, I think that I mean, that's a very broad question. I think over time, many companies have done that quite effectively. I think the best companies are always iterating. You look at a company like Tesla, and despite the craziness of Elon Musk and social media, he's really done an amazing job with Tesla at listing their customers and having it almost instantly impact their pipeline, uh, the innovation pipeline of their product itself, of their automobile, adding new features that consumers have actually asked. So that's one company that comes to mind. You look at 
the, the growth of Tesla and their stock price. And I think it's really um, no coincidence that they're a company that has really been, especially in an automotive industry, a company that an industry that's known for not necessarily being agile, right? Being one that's been very iterative at listening to consumers. Definitely. Um, well, that's really the end of the questions there for you, Matt. Great. Great. Um, well, why don't we go back and we'll just throw open my contact info um, in case anyone has any questions. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for joining us. This is now our eighth State of the Consumer webinar. Um, our first one was way back um, the first week of March, and it's been really a great way to engage with people. Um, again, if there's any way that we can help anyone who's on the webinar um, understand more about the consumer, we're always happy to help. We're always here to try to add value um, in any way I can. Um, we're really just trying to build a community of brands that believe in consumer centricity, believe in the importance of letting the consumer help drive your decisions. So I'm um, able thank you and the marketing team as always for helping, uh, you know, produce this, uh, this webinar. I know it's a lot of work and uh, to everyone who continues to tune in, we just want to thank you guys. Um, and I hope everyone is enjoying their very unusual summer 2020 uh, and staying safe. So on behalf of the entire Susie team and myself, uh, we're signing off. Thanks so much, everyone.